Have you been sworn, Mr. O'Connor? Yes, sir, I have. Fine, thank you. If you would, please. Mr. O'Connor, tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury who you are. My name is Paul K. O'Connor. I was from Gainesville, Florida. Would you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what you were doing when you were 21 years old? Yes. What were you doing? I was a hospital corpsman, United States Navy, and I was stationed in Bethesda, Maryland. At Bethesda Hospital, where the president was brought? Yes, sir. Were you present when they brought the president in? Yes, sir. And would you tell uh, the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what your duties were? at Bethesda Hospital at that time? Well, I worked with a partner. Uh, we assisted in post-mortem. My job in post-mortem was to remove the, the uh, deceased brain. Are you, are you just a little bit nervous? A little bit. Well, I don't blame you. <laughs> it's all right. Just take your time. If he was that close to me, I'd be a little worried, too. <laughs> <Mr. O'Connor. clears throat> I'll back off. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Just, we're, we're all in this together, so just I understand. Just take your time. Speak up just a little bit, if you would, please, Mr. O'Connor. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, as I said before, my job was to remove uh, the de a deceased person's brain and prepare it for uh, putting, it, putting it in formalin so it was fixed so that the uh, pathologist could examine it at a later date. And uh, did you prepare to do that in, uh, in the president's case? Yes, sir, I did. Did you see, uh, who was in charge of the uh, autopsy there? Uh, Commander Boswell, Commander Humes. Was, uh, who, who was actually, w had his hands on the, on the president doing the autopsy? Dr. Humes did. Who else was there in that autopsy room? Describe the scene, just so the jury can see it in their own eyes. Well, you have to imagine what the autopsy room looked like. It was quite large, it had an amphitheater. It was used for teaching. All right. Pathology. The room was filled full of Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, high-ranking officers, uh, civilians. Of, it was jam-packed. All right. Did you, uh, what, what was the attitudes of the, of the people? Uh, was it calm? No. no. What was it? It was very hysterical. Uh, w w w was Dr. Hume receiving any interference in what he was doing? We were interfered with constantly, yes. And who was interfering with what was going on? Well, there was Admiral Berkeley, the president's physician at the time. What was he doing? He just interfered constantly. Uh, he he would we go to do a procedure, and he said, "No, don't let's don't do that. Let's do something else." Or the Kennedy family family wouldn't like that. Or it, just, it was on and on like that all the time. Now, when the president came in, uh, what did you do? The casket came in approximately eight o'clock in the evening. They set the casket on the floor beside the table, and we opened the casket. Inside was a body bag. The body bag was unzipped, and we removed the president's body and placed it on the table. Did you help do that? Yes. Did you have your hands on him? Yes. At what point, part of, the, of his body, sir? Uh, his shoulders. All right. You were at the head end? Yes. Well, now let's just describe to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what you were prepared to do. What were you prepared to do? Prepare the body remove the brain. And you were prepared to remove the brain? Yes. You take a small uh, chisel and you pry the cranium loose and open up the top of the skull where you have the dura mater, which is a tough fibrous membrane that covers the brain. That's then cut with a pair of scissors all the way around close to where you've done the cutting with a saw. That exposes the whole top of the brain. At that time, you reach in very gently with your, with your left hand and you pull up the front of the brain and cut the optic nerves and other nerves and veins and arteries that hold and support the cranium, I mean the brain in the cranium. All right, now, Mr. O'Connor, in this case, we have developed some facts that when these doctors who testified here came before this jury to testify there was no they were never shown a brain although they were told there had been a brain placed in a, for, a bucket of formaldehyde but they never were shown the brain do you have an explanation for that yes i do would you tell the jury what the explanation is the president's brains were literally blown out of his head he had none 
Are you saying that there was no brain in the presidency? There was no brain. There were pieces of brain matter that were inside the cranium, just macerated pieces. Nothing that you could tell one part from the other. Well, what do you mean there were pieces? How much of the, how much of the brain was left in the skull? Maybe a handful at the most. You mean a full handful or what? Maybe a half a handful. Now, did you open the president's brain as you would in an ordinary case? We didn't have to. You mean you, you didn't peel the president's brain back? Mm, no, sir. No, no, no. We, there was nothing to do. He had a monstrous hole in his head. And so there was never a cut around or the hole or the brain taken out? We didn't have to. Because the brain wasn't there? The brain was gone for all practical purposes. It was gone. Well, when doctor, when these people draw pictures of the brain, when these people say that there were pictures taken, photographs taken of the brain, what do you have to say about that? They must be talking about somebody else. Well, were you at the f head of the president all during the time the autopsy the was taken? The whole time. When people say that the brain was put in, fixed in per formaldehyde, is that true? No. Is that a lie, sir? It has to be. There's no brain. Thank you, sir. You may examine. <clears throat> Mr. O'Connor, you were 21 at the time, sir? The time of the uh, About incident? 21 or 22. Okay. I'm not really sure right now, sir. I have no, no doubt, Mr. O'Connor, that in a normal situation, it would be you who would remove the brain from the uh, decedent. But this obviously and unquestionably was not a normal situation. You certainly agree with me on that? Mm, yes, sir. Okay. Is it possible then that that the autopsy surgeons would have done this, as opposed to you, in this situation, since it was so unusual? Well, they did most of the mundane jobs that we did that night. Okay. But they did not remove the brain from the body? There was no brain to be removed. The official autopsy report in this case, Mr. O'Connor, dated November the 22nd, 1963, states on page 4, the brain is removed and preserved for further study following formal formalin fixation. Also, from the surface of the disrupted right cerebral cortex, two small irregularly shaped fragments of metal are recovered. These measure 7 by 2 millimeters and 3 by 1 millimeter. These are placed in the custody of agents Francis X. O'Neill, Jr. and James W. Siebert of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, who executed a receipt therefore. Now, Mr. O'Connor, three surgeons signed their name to this autopsy report. Are you saying that none of these things happened? Not to my knowledge, they didn't. Okay. <clears throat> now, would you agree, uh, Mr. O'Connor, that the president arriving at Bethesda Hospital with his brain already having been removed is one of the most shocking things that you've ever seen in your whole life? Not the most, but one of the most. Okay, <laughs> certainly one of the most. Yes. And it goes without saying that you felt this is something that should have been investigated, right? Well, I figured it would be. Okay. In fact, throughout the years, you've often wondered what the answer to, the, to it was, right? Oh, I still have okay. questions. Now, in 1978, you were interviewed by the House Select Committee on Assassinations. Is that correct? That's correct. And this was a one-and-a-half-hour interview. Yes, sir, as I can remember. We're pretty much in-depth, right? Yes, sir. Okay. They wanted to know about your observations that night, right? That's right. They want to talk to everyone who had anything to do with this matter. That's correct. Okay. Now, Mr. O'Connor, if the president's brain being missing <coughs> from his head is one of the most shocking things that you've ever seen in your entire life, a matter that you think should have been investigated, certainly, and if they spoke to you for one and a half hours, about your observations that night, why wasn't it important enough for you to tell these people about it? I was under orders not to talk until that time. What? I was under orders not to talk to anybody. By whom? By uh, the United States military brought in orders a couple days after the autopsy, and we were to remain, remain silent. But you talked to them for an hour and a half. You told them all types of things in that document. I got received permission from the Select Committee on Assassinations to talk to the Secretary of Navy and Secretary of Defense. Paul, when I first asked you this question over the phone, did you tell me 
The reason I never told them is they never asked me. Well, they didn't ask me. And that's why you didn't tell them? Yes. So in other words, Mr. O'Connor, even though this is one of the most shocking things that you've ever seen, and you're, you're going to remember it to the day you die, and you feel this matter should have been investigated, if those investigators from the House Select Committee didn't ask you the magic question, by golly, you're not about to tell them it. Is that correct? No, sir. I only asked what, uh, answer what I was asked, and that was it. I, I see. Elaborate. Thank you. No further questions. Fine. Thank you, Mr. O'Connor. You may step down. Thank you, Honor. Thank you very much.